We didn't want this war. We didn't start this war. We didn't even expect this war. But it is a war that we have to win, that Hamas declared on us. And we have a right to win because if we don't, Hamas will drag us into a war again because it is threatening to perpetrate more October 7th massacres. There is no one in the world right now who wants this war to end more than the Israeli people. Welcome to the season finale of Inspiration for the Nation. And who better than the most eloquent voice out of Israel, Elon Levy, to come and speak on the program, to share what he's seen a little behind the scenes and how he is fighting the most terrible, hateful, vile people on this planet. You'll also hear at the end of the episode a few of my thoughts on just living the Chaim as a whole, some things that I've never shared before that I want to... It's the season finale. I feel like it's the right time to share. And you'll also hear about three incredible opportunities, my friends at Twillery, which I'm actually rocking right now, and the discount code that we have for you, an awesome buck from Mosaic Press that I know that you're going to love, and also the incredible opportunity you have to help the folks at Sine Academy You'll hear all about that now. Let's jump right in to my conversation with Elon. I'm Yaakov Langer, and you're listening to Inspiration for the Nation. Thank you so much, Elon. I know you're busy, and thank you so much for being here. But And I want to get into what you're currently doing now. But And I've seen so many interviews with you, but a little background. Can you tell me where you're from and how you got to where you are today? I'm originally from London. I'm a diaspora Jew born to Israeli parents, but born and raised in London. When I finished my university studies, I said, it's now or never. I want to come and serve in the Israeli army. So I came on the last day of Operation Protective Edge, the war with Hamas in 2014. I came, I served in the army. I started a career in media as a television news anchor. From there, I started working with the president of Israel, Isaac Herzog, as his foreign media advisor uh, for the first two years of his presidency. And when the October 7th massacre happened, I was a private citizen, uh, like many people, woken up in the morning by the sirens, spending the first few days not understanding what to do with myself, how to be useful. And as part of the incredible mobilization of Israeli society, which bounces back more quickly from disaster than any society in the world. Everyone started doing anything they could to be useful. And for me, that meant in just a week, becoming an official spokesman for the Israeli government somehow. Does that lead you to be nervous just jumping into the role? Obviously, you have some background in what you're doing, but like, it's such a critical role for what's going on in the world today. Does that scare you at all? It's a tremendous amount of responsibility. Suddenly, anything that I tweet can become a headline, Israel says. And sometimes that's a very good thing. It means if I tweet a response to a libelous Human Rights Watch report that accuses Israel of deliberately starving civilians in Gaza, while we have placed no restrictions on the entry of humanitarian necessities, that becomes Israel's official response in the CNN live feed. It makes it into the New York Times. It's a huge amount of responsibility, and you have to try to be calm, take a deep breath, keep everything in proportion. Uh, thankfully, I've had enough years in front of the TV cameras as a TV journalist myself that it feels second nature being in a TV studio speaking into a camera. Other people might be more nervous if they have less experience. Uh, but I try to remember the gravity of the situation that we are in and the responsibility and just forgive the pun tunnel vision in focusing on the mission we have, which is to destroy Hamas and bring back the hostages safe and sound. You know, often in interviews or even journalism, when it's a very intense interview where there's two people and each side is battling out, one side is trying to do everything, everything they can to uproot the other side. And sometimes it's ironically uh, what they try to do is the total opposite. I think of Jordan Peterson. I don't know if you know what I'm referring to. Like that that fi that famous interview where like he just simply by just answering the questions was demolishing the woman, um, asking him those questions. And I, I feel like you had similarly kind of that moment with that journalist asking you those questions. What was going through your head at that time? And and for those who didn't see it, which is probably, you know, not even like 10 people, could you just describe what happened in that moment? 
There's a range of interviews. There are some interviews that are very fair and the journalists understand the story and they want to get more facts. And there are other interviews, and I find this, it's more common in the British media than the American media, uh, where they try to catch you on certain gotcha moments to try to put you on the spot, to try to squeeze an embarrassing confession out of you or admit that you don't know something. Um, and that can be very frustrating. What is also very frustrating is sometimes dealing with journalists who see the reality upside down. And it's a constant challenge to think, how do you push back on these questions and call them out for how outrageous the assumptions behind them are? When I tell a reporter that I hope he is hearing the voices from inside Gaza of the civilians who are beginning to express dissatisfaction with the Hamas terror regime, stealing aid, diverting aid into the tunnels. And he tells me, but you're not even giving them a chance to overthrow Hamas because you haven't stopped bombing them. I mean, how do you push back on that? Mm. How do you push back on the outrageous accusation that the fact that we are willing to release violent criminals from jail to get our stolen children back means that we undervalue lives? Uh, sometimes you have to push back and challenge the insinuation or the assumption behind the question. And that's part of making our case. We need to present facts. We need to present our narrative. And we also need to call out when the question is coming from a place that has simply taken reality and turned it upside down. What would you say to someone who, sadly, is still on the fence? They're like looking at what's going on and they're like, well, we don't know if we're on Israel's side. What would you tell them? Obviously, you don't have like 15 hours to convince them, but like in a statement, what would you tell those people? That we are fighting for humanity, that we are fighting for the most basic human right of babies to sleep in their beds and not be abducted. We're fighting for the most basic human right of Israeli girls not to be raped by masked terrorists. That's what we're fighting for. We didn't want this war. We didn't start this war. We didn't even expect this war. But it is a war that we have to win, that Hamas declared on us. And we have a right to win because if we don't, Hamas will drag us into a war again because it is threatening to perpetrate more October 7th massacres. There is no one in the world right now who wants this war to end more than the Israeli people. We want the hostages home. We want our friends who are in reserves to come home. We want to go back to our lives and rebuild this country. But we don't have the luxury of making this conflict go away and retreating to safety. We have to bring to justice the October 7th monsters who burned, beheaded, and raped so many innocent people on October 7th, or else they will do it again, just like they have been threatening to do every waking moment since that dark Saturday. There is a, a video that the Israel put together. It's, it's a private video that... Um, Many people were privileged to see it, and I don't know if privilege is even the right word because it's it's so horrifying. Yeah. The first question is, did you see it? And if you did, what, what was your feelings after seeing it? I watched uh, an early draft of that uh, video. And afterwards, I, I quickly drew up my response for a press conference that I had to deliver. And, and I spoke about the bodies. I lost count at some point of how many bodies, burned bodied, twisted bodies, tortured bodies, lying by the road, sprawled out on a bed, burned to a charcoal, old people, babies, beheaded people. It's simply horrific. And you understand that what Hamas did on October 7th was a campaign of systematic extermination. They intentionally and methodically tried to murder as many people as they could, as brutally as they could. And I think that Chris Cuomo gave a fantastic uh, monologue on his channel the other day where he said he thinks what Hamas was trying to do was to deliberately raise Holocaust associations in people's minds. They deliberately tried to recreate the most savage excesses of the Holocaust, reducing people to human ash, because they wanted to awaken in us those primordial fears. But we're not the world's punching bag. Israel is a place where Jews stand tall and Jews fight back. 
And that is exactly what we're going to do. And I'm reminded of that scene from the new biopic of Golda Meir, played by Helen Mirren, where she's on the phone with Henry Kissinger and he's putting pressure on her. And he tells, she tells him the story of how she used to hide and her family used to hide from the pogroms in Russia. And before ending the conversation, she tells him angrily, I'm not that little girl hiding in the closet. We're not that little girl hiding anymore. When genocidal monsters want to murder our children, behead them, burn them, rape them, we fight back. And we're committed to the state of Israel's sacred pledge that has guided us ever since we reclaimed our sovereignty in our ancient land out of the ashes of the Holocaust. The state of Israel will go to the ends of the earth to bring our people home to safety and to bring their tormentors to justice. We will be right back to my conversation with me and Elon. But first, let me tell you about my friends at Mosaic Press. You've heard me talk about them and how it's transformed personally my Shabbosim because who like me, it has time to, I'm like watching the whole week. When do I read? So I read on Shabbos. Shout out to David Bishavkin over there. And I picked up a lot of their books and it's just been making my Shabbos, my wife Shabbos, even my kids Shabbosim, um, so beautiful, so nice. And it's really, you know, we live in the busiest time and to go ahead and be able to pick up something that connects us back to the past, but also gives us tools to live a better life now. It's just beautiful. And that's exactly why the breathtaking panorama, uh, first off, if you're watching this, you will see the gorgeous cover. I 100% judge books by its covers. And uh, Mosaic Press, you hit it out of the park again this time with the cover. It is by Rabbi Jonas Sklar. And it's giving you this very unique view of Yitzhiz Mitzrayim leaving Egypt, which is coming up in the Parshos. And more than just telling you over the story in the unique way. I love how this book has been so practical. It gives you actual advice about relationships, how you could have a better marriage, all from that story that happened when we left Mitzrayim and how to raise children. And I love how it blended it blended family, faith, and freedom. Uh, it's just something that like, how do you make that practical? Well, Rabiona does that. If you haven't yet, go pick up this book in your local Svarm stores. If you go to mosaicopress.com, you will get 18% off with the code word L'chaim. So go ahead. If you know someone in your life that would appreciate this book, buy it for a gift. It's cool. It's cool now to buy books as gifts. And maybe we'll trademark that. Actually, I don't want to trademark it. I want you all to use that as much as possible. Now back to my conversation with Elon. I recently interviewed Rabbi Yisrael Meir Lau, the former chief mm -hmm. rabbi. Uh, and a Holocaust survivor. And okay. I asked him the question on, or, or maybe it was my, my partner who was with me, Shalemi Zions, the question on everyone's mind, as a Holocaust survivor, how would you compare what happened on October 7th to the Holocaust? So he first said that obviously any tragedy is like incomparable. It, it's, it's every tragedy in, within itself is so terrible. Um, but he said a very big distinction is when the Holocaust occurred, he, he's like, I, I, I didn't have an Israeli army. We had the Jews. We didn't have a way to defend ourselves. And now that we do, there's never going to be something to stop us. We're we have our home and we're going to defend it. And we have the people who will defend it. We don't we don't want to be in this position. But no matter what, we're never going to back down. There are huge differences, of course. The scale. The fact that whereas the Nazis tried to hide their atrocities, Hamas filmed it and distributed the footage because it was proud of it. The fact that we have a state and an army and we can defend ourselves and we can go after the people who come to kill us. But there are also similarities. This was a massacre conducted with Nazi-like cruelty and Nazi-like efficiency because 1,200 people murdered over half a day times that by the length of the Second World War, you reach 6 million. And in the service of a Nazi-like ideology that seeks the violent murder of every Jew in the world. And I want to share with you one of the more disturbing thoughts that I had after 10-7, when we heard the horrific testimonies coming out of how Hamas brutally tortured people to death and then mutilated and disposed of their bodies. 
that for so long we have been used to thinking of the Nazis as an unparalleled level of evil. It was simply ontologically impossible for anything to approximate the evil of the Nazis, and therefore anyone who suggested comparing anything to the Nazis, that's obviously an outrageous accusation, because because philosophically there can be nothing as evil as the Nazis. And on October 7th, on 10-7, we woke up to an evil on a par with the Nazis. And the only difference is the means. Because if Hamas had the means to do what the Nazis did, we have no doubt they would have done it and they would have taken glee in doing so. So how do we as the Jewish people continue now in a world in which the Nazis are no longer the ultimate symbol of evil? Because they have met their match in the Hamas death squads that burned, beheaded, tortured, mutilated, and raped 1,200 Israelis on October 7th. For people not in Israel now, and they're only, I guess, seeing what's going on through podcasts, videos, the news, X, social media, how would you describe the unity about the Jewish people in the land of Israel right now? The sudden shift we had on October 7th was incredible and will be written about in the history books. Israel had spent the last few years of deep, political and domestic turmoil, back-to-back elections, constant infighting, a year of the largest protest this country had ever seen. People were bandying the word civil war in the air, wondering how we could live with each other. The political debate had poisoned the atmosphere. And on October 7th, everyone dropped everything and said, we have one mission now, to bring back the hostages and destroy Hamas. Two missions, but it's the same mission. Everyone dropped everything. We put our Jewish wars to one side and we came together under one banner towards victory. And that is something that unites this country from left and right. Even the most dovish members of Israeli society, among the Zionist majority, of course, say that this war must end with the end of Hamas, that there is no future for Israel living next to the Hamas terror regime. And so we have an incredible moment of unity where people simply dropped everything and did everything they could do to support the war effort, baking spaghetti for soldiers and wrapping toothpaste and socks to deliver to the front and donating money to the survivors from the kibbutzim. And I found myself here as a government spokesman, as part of the same mobilization of civil society. And I'm proud to be a member of a society that at the moment of truth, after such historic polarization, dropped everything and came together. And it is so not obvious when you think about it from a Jewish perspective, from a perspective of Jewish history. We haven't done that in the past. During the Jewish march of folly, as the author Amots Asael calls it, there have been so many points in our nation's history when we continued fighting each other, even as the enemy was at the gates. Most famously, in ancient Jerusalem, when the Romans besieged Jerusalem and the civil war didn't stop inside. And we have barked that historical trend now that at the moment of truth, we dropped everything and we came together to face the common enemy that wants us all dead. And I'm so proud to belong to this resilient nation that bounces back in such an incredible, awe-inspiring way. That's really beautiful. Coming along with being the spokesman is a lot of people looking to hear what you have to say. And that comes with a lot of haters. How do you deal with the hate mail and I'm sure the death threats and all the negativity and just horribleness aimed at you? Uh, We'll do a mean tweets uh, TikTok video at some point soon. (laughs) Uh, Try to brush it off. Look, there's an intense amount of hatred for Jews and for anyone who speaks up for Jews and speaks up for Israel. And the world would be a pretty lonely place if I were just declaring war on the world. But I have behind me an incredible nation, the people in Israel, Jews around the diaspora, non-Jewish supporters from around the world who send me messages on Instagram and Twitter, messages of support, who understand why we are fighting and understand why we have to win. And that gives me moral encouragement because people are constantly pushing me and saying, keep going, keep going, keep going. We know that we are right. 
We know that history and morality and law and justice are all on our side, and we have to keep plowing ahead. And as for the people who hate us, well, if they start carrying uh, my face on posters through London, as I've seen, it means we're getting under their skin. And it means we're doing our job properly because we fight back and we push back. And we do that in the kinetic war and we do that in the information war as well. You come after us and we are coming after you too. We'll be right back this week's episode and coming up is my favorite moment from this entire interview. But first, let me tell you that this episode is in memory of Shemin David Ben Yaakov Shlema as well as Miriam Sarah Bas Yaakov Moshe. I have two quick messages to tell you. First off, What's been happening since October 7th has been affecting the world, mainly affecting Israel, but it's also affecting the Jews in America. There are so many Jewish kids that come from traditional homes or homes that maybe aren't as observant as you and I. And two things are happening. One thing that's happening is so many of them are saying, we are done with sending our kids to public school. We wanna send them to a good place like Sinai Academy. And there's also people saying the reverse of saying, you know what, we don't want our kids or the kids themselves saying we don't want to look Jewish and and maybe wear Mug and David or Yamaka, whatever it is. And unfortunately, they're trying to blend in and not be proud of their Judaism. Sinai Academy, if you're from Brooklyn, you know who I'm talking about. And even if you're not from Brooklyn, you probably know the beautiful work that they do, that they literally save the 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 souls, the Jewish souls of so many boys and um they get a real sense of what it means to be part of the Orthodox community. And if you've seen like what happens, you don't just see a transformation right then and there. You see throughout their entire life, so many people that you know in your life probably could be they're a rabbi now or they're a balabas, whatever they are, they're doing in their life, they seamlessly just blend it in and are proud Orthodox Jews. And that is done through the magic at Sinai Academy. And they're whole goal is to save the Jewish boys of Klal Yisrael from assimilation. And what more powerful thing could you do than helping save Jewish souls? And how can you do that as well? Sinai Academy has an auction and you go to SinaiAuction.org. It's going to be actually a live auction on January 13th, which is on Matzah Shabbos, Saturday night. So right after you finish Inspiration for the Nation at 8.30 p.m., you could tune in. Of course, you're going to have fun People there like Joey Newcomb and Benny Friedman and uh, David Blatt, the magician, they're also going to raffle off the best prizes you've ever heard. So if you're buying a ticket to help support Sinai Academy, you're already winning because you're helping Jewish boys not assimilate and, and be proud of who they are and join the Yeshiva at Sinai Academy. That's honestly the real prize. But let me give you 20% of the prizes that you could win and how with this code, you're gonna get even more. You could win, I have a list over here. These are 20% of the prizes, $100,000. You could win a three-year uh, Nissan car lease. You could win a, a spot at the care of round table. You could win wigs. And when I say wigs, no, they're not raffling off one wig, they're raffling off multiple wigs. You could win tons of jewelry, trip to Orlando, trip to Israel, custom suits by Fino. Again, this is only 20% of the things that you could win. Go on to their website, sinaiauction.org to see there. But if you are an inspiration for the nation, listen, if you put in the code double four, that's D O U B L E number four, double four, you will double your chances. So if you buy two tickets, you're going to get basically four tickets and any, any ticket that you put in is going to double. So why not use that code? It's a free code to use. So go ahead and use the code, um, double four at Sinai Academy and help the Jewish boys be proud of being Jews and and listen, even if you don't do care of, here is your opportunity to be a part of that force that is doing care of and bringing closer our brothers and sisters. Right before we get back to this week's episode, I am rocking right now the Twillery short sleeve button down shirt. Right before I started this episode, my friend, a, a Twitter celeb texted me, I'm about to order the pants. What's the code? I'm like, the code is INSPIRE when you spend $139 and it's your first time. And I I ask you all to go and use the code because if you want to step up your game with wearing clothing that not just that you look good in, but you also feel good in it. It's important to feel good in the clothing you wear. But more than that, it's also clothing that lasts a long time. I've said this 
over and over. My pants from Twillery are more than five years old. I wear them every day. I, I have to switch them more often, um, but I'm just so comfortable with them. I'm like, yeah, I just wore it yesterday. I'm going to wear it again today. And uh, you've you've seen the air suit. You've seen me talk about their suits. If it was up to me, I would just wear their short sleeve button down shirts that I'm wearing now. This is like the black version of it. Um, they're so cozy and also like great access for Twillin. Also, I, you know, it looks like I have muscles. Um, I don't have muscles, but the shirt makes me look kind of like I do. Um, look good, feel good. Use code word INSPIRE for Twillery. Now back to my conversation with Elon. So typically what's happened when Israel had to defend itself, it was it was a very physical war. Like, okay, so the attackers come in, we're going to defend ourselves, and we've won every single time, thank God. But right now what's going on, there's also this digital war. I mean, I see, you know, T4 over here, but Living L'Chai, and we've been posting since October 7th, we've racked up over a half a billion views on YouTube alone. Amazing. Of just trying to be positive. Amazing. But the, the, the amount of... Thank you. Thanks so much. But the amount of like pro-Palestinian and pro-Hamas rhetoric out there is just overwhelming. I'm in America and like I feel the hate. How how would you suggest is the best way for us to fight back? We are David against Goliath in the information war. The fact is there are only 16 million Jews. Not all of them are with us. And so many more Arabs, so many more Muslims, so many more people who are automatically receptive to the Palestinians' message. We are outnumbered and outgunned in the information war. And that's why we have to fight back extra hard. Uh, we have to push back against the hate. We have to push back against the lies. And sometimes it feels like playing whack-a-mole, tack, 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 trying to get rid of uh, all the lies at the same time. And, and sometimes we are drowned out simply by numbers. Um, it's important to remember that social media doesn't reflect the real world, however. It reflects a certain part of public opinion. And I saw an illuminating study by the pollster Frank Luntz that suggested that one of the best predictors of whether people are going to be pro-Hamas is whether they tweet every day. There is a direct correlation between being pro-Hamas and being an active social media user. And Twitter is not the real world. And despite all the hate we get on social media, I know that when I go into an interview, I'm not speaking to the Twitter cesspit. I'm speaking to the ordinary people at home watching TV while they're doing the dishes and the kids are playing with their Lego or whatever, who would never allow their country to come under the savage and barbaric attack that we faced on October 7th, who would expect their country to go to the ends of the earth to bring back hostages and to bring those terrorists to justice. And we're talking to them and communicating our story that all we want, all we want is the rights that every normal citizen in every normal country has. Nothing more and nothing less. We don't think it's a lot to demand, and we think that people understand it. I know you just have a few more minutes, but I want to ask you a few more questions. Is there a story that happened since October 7th that, that gives you chizik, that inspires you? We've had so many stories of the atrocities of October 7th and victimhood, but also some incredible stories of heroism. Incredible stories of people who drove back and forth into the Nova massacre to try to rescue as many strangers as they could, of ordinary people in the first response teams of the kibbutzim who fought like lions despite sustaining the most horrific injuries. It was a moment that brought out the best heroism of our people. And that reminds us what we are fighting for as well, we are fighting for an incredible nation that in times of stress doesn't fall apart, that grows stronger. And I hope that we will emerge from this war stronger as well. And I mean that not only as Israeli society, the whole Jewish world, that this will be a moment that will remind us how much we are in the same boat. And, uh, you know, I don't remember chapter and verse from the Talmud, but you pinch one hand and the other hand feels it too. What happens in the US affects us and what happens here affects you as well. And I hope after this war, we'll remember how much we need each other, how much we love each other, and how much we share not only a history, but also a common fate and a common destiny. You personally, let's assume that hopefully 
today. All the hostages are returned. Every we kill from your mouth ha- to God's ears. Yes, they're they're done, and everything's great. Where where do you personally go from here? Like, if that would happen, <laughs> like is, your life shifted so quickly in the past few months. Uh, people are asking me what will happen with me after the war, and my answer is I don't know how old I will be after the war. Oh man, oh man. We know this is going to take time. It is going to take time to demolish the terror state that Hamas has spent 16 years embedding under schools, homes, and hospitals in Gaza. And that's before we get onto the question of the Northern Front. At the moment, we are warning Hezbollah that if it drags us into a full-scale war, it will be making the mistake of a lifetime. And the consequences for Lebanon will be severe. And in the face of its systematic violations of UN Resolution 1701, Unless there is an effective diplomatic solution, we will continue making preparations to repel the threat to our home front of hundreds of rockets that have fallen in northern Israel and whole communities that have been evacuated from the border because we can't take the risk of Hezbollah pulling off a 10-7 massacre along that border with Lebanon. And it takes two to tango and we'll have to see what happens on the northern border. So obviously I hope that this situation will end soon, but this situation will end when it has to end, when we have eliminated the threat from Hamas, when we have repelled the threat from Hezbollah, because we simply cannot afford to finish this in the middle. We cannot afford to finish in the middle and retreat to safety somewhere because there is no retreating to safety somewhere. We're fighting against a brutal terror state that wants us all dead and has shown the brutality and cruelty. It is happy, happy to use if given half a chance, and we can't leave it even a quarter of a chance. From your position, seeing how vile the UN has been, I mean, they've always been bad, but especially in the past two plus months, what is your opinion of the UN? The UN has been awful. Its officials are covering up for the fact that they are covering up for Hamas. They are deflecting blame onto us to cover up the fact that not the Red Cross and not the World Health Organization and definitely not UNRWA, none of the other alphabet soup of UN agencies have condemned Hamas for waging war out of hospitals, for hijacking aid, and for perpetrating the brutal atrocities of October 7th. And in that way, they are, through their silence, deliberately, actively, or or, or simply passively and by omission, complicit with Hamas's strategy of waging war against us because they are poisoning minds around the world against us by covering up for the crimes that Hamas is perpetrating against us and at the expense of their own people. And we are demanding accountability because they've let us down. They've obviously let the Palestinian people down, but they're letting down the whole world when the World Health Organization can't condemn Hamas for holding a headquarters, a military headquarters in the basement of a hospital, the whole world is underserved by these organizations that have been hijacked by a radical agenda instead of doing their job of advancing international peace and security. And we are going on the offensive, demanding accountability and demanding answers. What do they plan to do to stop terrorists from exploiting the international community's goodwill ever again. We're going to continue fighting Hamas. We will do what it takes to bring down that terror state. And we think it's about time that they condemn Hamas for the crimes against humanity it is perpetrating against our people at the expense of their own people. Last question. Sadly, what's going on? We're still, unfortunately, in the thick of it. But, you know, hopefully very soon this should end, I I hope. But what's going to happen after? There's there's still so much trauma, and especially I'm just thinking of the children, the children in Israel, the children, the Jewish children around the world. There's so much trauma. What what would you tell a child who's kind of been observing what's been going on? What would you tell them to to help them go on and be strong in their life? One of the small mercies during uh, this difficult time is I don't have children. I need to shield from the news. It's it's a really big challenge for parents when the news is constantly in the background to try to keep the worst atrocities from their children and to keep them calm and to maintain a sense of normality for them. And it's important to surround them with as much love and support and guidance and a feeling of safety 
as possible uh, and to embrace them with love. Embrace them with love. Elon, thank you so much for doing this and keep up your holy work. We're, we're looking at you. The world is looking at you and uh, no we pressure. appreciate you. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you so much for watching or listening to this week's episode. And I got to give a shout out to my friends at the Kiddish Club podcast. I know that they got Elon because they did a great episode with him. Go and, and look at that. I'll, I'll link it in the show notes. But they have such a fun podcast. It is to me, the most fun Jewish podcast out there, Kiddish Club. So thanks again for connecting me with Elon. And um, yeah, go check them out if you have, you for sure have heard of them. So go ahead and check them out if you haven't listened yet. If you did not go join Sinai Academy's mission and you could get a ticket at SinaiAuction.org, buy one ticket, buy 10 tickets, whatever it is, hopefully you'll win the prize, but you'll get the ultimate prize of helping a Jewish neshama come back, learn Torah, and change their lives and the trajectory of their children forever. If you haven't yet gotten Twillery, go ahead, go to their website, Twillery.com, use the promo code INSPIRE, $18 off. My friend, yesterday, he's actually a celeb, I won't say who he is, was telling me, he's like, okay, behind closed doors, how are they, I'm thinking of getting their pants. I said, you could quote me on it, get the pants and if you don't like them i'll cover so i'm so why well, i'm not like a gavir over here i'm so confident that he will enjoy it and last and certainly not least go to mosaicapress.com and you can use the code lechayim for 18 percent off on honestly any of the books as as of this is running so i don't know how how long this will last for so go ahead but most importantly get the breathtaking panorama by rabbi Jonas glar you're going to love it as much as we did over here at Living the Chaim. Okay, now getting into the, I guess, idea that I want to share with you. When we started this year, I think we were at around 100,000 subscribers on YouTube. We are right now at over a million subscribers, which is, I can't even understand that. I saw yesterday that we've gotten over a half a billion views on primarily our shorts and it's it's very bittersweet on one hand we're we're we feel very sad that most of these are obviously just content that we're trying to promote and just show how awesome the jewish people are how awesome israel is how awesome the people of israel are and um you know we have a lot of pr against us and we 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 know it's our mission we're you know the biggest Jewish YouTube channel, I think, at this point. And it's our mission to just promote. Right now, at first we're promoting like the wisdom and maybe in an entertaining way, um, just Jewish culture and thoughts and ideas. But right now we're we're trying to defend the 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 state of Israel and just Jewish pride as a whole. We're we're very happy to be Jewish and we're we feel lucky and proud. And we 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 feel very sad that a lot of our views has come from the aftermath of s such a horrible event and, and there's still so many hostages. But we do feel hopeful that we're putting out into the world the, the good. You know, I, I don't know if you've noticed, we've been very intentional not to, to put out, even, even if something's true, we don't want to put out any neg negative, just negativity. Um, we're not perfect with that. But there's like one time we put out a video and we, you know, after it aired, a lot of people were watching it, but we're like, you know what? this is just too negative. We want to be positive. That's what we are about. We want to spread the light and we want to sp spread the truth as well. So we're very proud that our channel has grown because of our mission to promote Jewish pride and uh, we'll never take that away. And we owe all of this to you. I mean, we thank you, Hashem, <laughs> obviously, but people like you who watch our episodes, who hit the like button, by the way, hit like on this video, who comment, I mean, we've seen such incredible conversations come out just within the YouTube comments or Spotify comments, and obviously it helps promote the video, but also it, it helps give a dialogue. We, we've seen so many places that the dialogue is not fear, and we've seen, I've personally seen on TikTok, like so many videos just get put into a, a a jar that's called labeled bad and it will not get promoted to people but thank god we we at this uh also big thank you to youtube we we have so much opportunity to have more dialogue more truthful dialogue so every time you like a video that is 
not just doing us wonders it's also helping the jewish people and also the world like we're just here to try to promote truth and also of course if you leave comments and just continue the conversation like we're maybe the megaphone but we're not the only people in the room and there's so many great voices out there and um we will not stop it's just the beginning for us we have fought well i'm going to a meeting after this maybe six new shows as of next year so if you haven't yet subscribed, subscribe to our YouTube channel, share it with friends and family or your enemy. Show it to them, show them the truth. And um, thanks for coming on the ride with us. This is just the beginning. Remember, inspiration is everywhere. L'chaim. Living L'chaim.